Using the same idea as before, we will now define an embedding of the Grassmannian of m-dimensional subspaces in V into a projective space. This is the version with coordinates. So I pick an m-dimensional subs subspace of Kn and choose a basis. And I will, as before, write each vi as a row vector of a matrix so that I have an m by n matrix. And it's clear that I can define a map by taking all m by m minors of this matrix. What happens is that changing to a different basis of w would have given me an action on these coordinates by an m by m matrix. And when I compute the minors, I get a simultaneous scaling by the determinant of this matrix. So the homogeneous coordinates are in fact well defined. So here we choose a basis for W, compute the m by m minors of this basis matrix, the m by n matrix formed by the coordinates of a basis. This is called the Plücker embedding of the Grassmannian. So we have to show that it's an embedding. These are uh, left as exercises. Let me write down the key points. So the first exercise is to show that locally I can write down, locally I can invert one of the minors. Therefore I can assume this minor or the matrix representing this minor is just the identity. For example, take the first m by m block, make it the identity. All the remaining coordinates, and there are m times n minus m coordinates now in this basis matrix, they are completely free to vary, giving me m-dimensional subspaces in V. Therefore, the Grassmannian locally looks like an affine space of this dimension m times n minus m. So the next exercise is to show that the Plücker embedding defined by computing the minors of this coordinate uh, matrix is indeed an embedding. So first you show injectivity using these affine charts and you have to say something about what happens when you have to switch charts or when you're outside of a particular chart. But this is an easy observation to make. And then uh, you have to say, well, the differentials, so in, a, in an affine chart, there's a very clear tangent space since you're an, on an affine chart and an affine space. Uh, you have to show that these tangent directions are not annihilated. Again, this is essentially a triviality. There will be linear coordinates when you compute these minors and the, in these affine coordinates. So this is uh, easy to see, which means that the Grassmannian should be seen as a subspace of this projective space. And then something we will see later, but something maybe you can try to convince yourself, is that the image is closed in this uh, Plücker embedding. So in this exercise of trying to convince yourself that the image is closed, you can play around with the Grassmannian of lines in P3, G24. And there we have an equation, a quadric, and any point satisfying this quadric should give us a two-plane inside a four-dimensional space. So that's one way to convince yourself. We will do this formally in the next uh, section. So now we want to study the Grassmannian without using coordinates. Some things become much clearer, in my opinion, and um, some things become a little bit more delicate, but uh, it's always quite a lot of fun to try to do geometric constructions without using coordinates. It's uh, quite instructive, and 
you will get a feel for what would have happened if the ambient space V uh, was varying in moduli, then how the Grassmannians would have varied. So you get a sense for these more uh, complicated constructions. So now we have, a, we have an ambient space V. It's not canonically identified with Kn, but it is isomorphic to Kn. And we have this GMV. If I pick a point on this Grassmannian, so a subspace W, then I can do the following construction. I take the mth wedge product of W and map it inside the mth wedge product of V. And the key observation here is that the mth wedge product of an m-dimensional space is one-dimensional. And you can choose a basis for W, let's say V1 through Vm, and V1 wedge v2, wedge v3, etc. up to vm will give you a basis for this line. Now we can define the Plücker map by just taking a w and sending it to the line generated by wedge m inside of wedge m of v. Okay, so I've defined a map from the Grassmannians into a projective space. Uh, you'll see that the dimension of the receiving space matches the n choose m minus one. Uh, so it really looks at least at first sight like the map that we've just described. And it's an exercise to show that if you had coordinates on V, then this map that I just described corresponds to computing the minors. Let's make the following definition so that we can better understand the uh, Plücker embedding of the Grassmannian. We say an element of wedge M V is decomposable if it's the wedge product of M vectors in V. So normally uh, this wedge M V has elements that are of the form that are sums of uh, these decomposable elements, but not every element is decomposable. Now it's clear that if we start with a subvector space of dimension M in V and we compute its Mth wedge product, uh, the resulting line will be generated by decomposable elements because I can just pick a basis of W and of course the representing element will be the wedge product of the spaces. On the other hand, if you give me a decomposable element, such as this one eta here, v1 wedge dot 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 wedge vm, then the vectors v1 through vm will span a subvector space of v. This subvector space has to be of dimension m if eta is non-zero. Therefore, every non-zero element that is decomposable actually comes from an m-dimensional subspace. Let's study then the locus of decomposable elements a little better to give a, another interpretation of the Grassmannian in terms of a pure linear algebra, one could say.
So what we do first is to study the linear map constructed from each element of wedge M V. So let's say I take eta, and with eta I can define a map from V to M plus one wedge product of V by simply taking this vector from V and wedging it with eta on the right. Let's make the following definition. We will say that eta is divisible by a vector v if eta is representable as the wedge product of v with some other element mu of now from the m minus 1 wedge product of v. Decomposable elements will have m vectors that divide it, m linearly independent vectors that divide it. And here's another way to find these vectors. You realize that the kernel of this map find from by eta wedge consists precisely of the vectors that divide eta. Now, one direction is trivial. If v divides eta, then eta wedge v will have two copies of v inside, and therefore it will be zero. Or the converse, uh, one super simple way is to use coordinates. There is also a proof without a coordinate, so uh, you choose uh, whichever version you prefer. We now observe that the dimension of the kernel of eta wedge map uh, is at most m, because there can only be m vectors that divide eta. And when this maximum dimension is attained, then eta has to be decomposable. Okay, I summarize these two uh, observations now on our paper. And this means I can translate the condition of being irreducible by passing to the rank of the map eta wedge, because of course this map is sending v into some other space. Therefore, if it was injective, it would have rank exactly n, the dimension of v, and every dimension that we use up for the kernel and decrease the rank of the map. The reason we wanted to switch to this rank condition is that the rank of a linear map can always be expressed by computing some minors. So the rank is always less than n minus m if and only if the corresponding matrix for this linear map has all of its minors of size n minus m plus 1 that vanish. And so given, let's say, eta in some coordinates, you can cook up the map eta wedge. Uh, you can write it as a matrix and you can realize that the entries are linear in terms of the coordinates of eta. And then now if you have to compute these minors that compute the rank and the zero locus in terms of your original coordinates of eta will cut out the Grassmannian. So sub-varieties of a projective space that can be expressed in terms of some uh, rank conditions are called determinantal varieties. So they have more structure than an arbitrary sub-variety. In this case, we see that the Grassmannian is a determinantal variety because we've expressed it using a rank condition. The bad thing about these uh, rank conditions is that the minors will have high degree and these are actually not the best equations that cut out the Grassmannian because it turns out that the Grassmannian can be defined by quadratic equations. So equations of degree 2, of course degree much less than n minus m plus 1.
So proving this fact that the Grassmannian can be cut out by quadratic equations is actually uh, non-trivial, but you can take a page from this uh, example with the Grassmannian of lines. There what we did was we realized in, the affine, in an affine chart that one of the minors could be expressed using uh, other elements, and here too you can realize that some elements multiply together to give full m by m minor. And if you want to see the full solution, then I'm giving you the reference in Harris's book, First Course in Algebraic Geometry in chapter six. There he uh, gives a full explanation, both using coordinates and without, on how to cook up these quadric equations. And if you want to do this, this is a hard exercise for those who like the challenge. That's it today. We've covered everything we need about the Grassmannians for our calculations to begin next week. I hope you enjoyed it and let's see each other on Monday.